purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. My thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them. No hunter can trap them. No person can deny. Hello and welcome to Free Thought Forum. I'm Randy Lutke. And uh, with us today, we have a very special guest by the name of Hugh Henry. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Hugh's going to talk to us about uh, the Pope's recent visit, his travels, tracing the steps of Paul, and, and some other interesting things today. What have you got for us? Well, we're going to start with Paul, and we're going to head way off from there. When the Pope went to Athens and spoke to the Greeks there, he was following in the footsteps of St. Paul. And I believe he spoke from the same place Paul did, which was the Areopagos. Now, you have the Parthenon sitting way up here, and then there's a spur of rock next to it, and beneath it is a natural amphitheater. Okay. And that spur of rock is like a natural pulpit. And I've been there, and that's where Paul came and spoke to the Greeks. And when he was there, he said he converted a man named Dionysius, which anglicized as Dennis. Hmm. And St. Dennis, uh, produced a body of writing that was extremely influential in Western civilization. It was extensively used by the uh, mystics, uh, Meister Arkart and uh, Hildegard of Bingen. That and the Song of Solomon were their favorite two things to work with. They didn't have much to do with revelations. And the other thing that, that he produced is something that was extremely influential on the organization of the church of governments and even of every business we have today. But there was a problem. Towards the end of the Middle Ages, they found out that this writing wasn't by this Dionysius. St. Dennis was actually a sixth century Syrian monk who was writing as if he were this guy, oh. which was perfectly acceptable style in those days. So this book got put in the back, in the corner, in the dark. and. You can get it today. This is everything he wrote. The title is Pseudo Dionysius, and it's available from Paulist Press. Now, half of this is the mystical writing, which is pretty heavy schledding. And the other half is the hierarchy, and that's where we get the word from. He invented the word, although I'm sure the thing existed as a concept before that. He had this vision of heaven and the world in which you had God at the top and then the archangels and the cherubim and the seraphim and the chairs and the angels and then you had man and all of the animals down to bacteria and then you had the imps and the devils and the archdemons. It was a big thing like this. And that was the hierarchy. Hierarchy means order of angels. Now in 450 AD, Rome falls. It had been in pretty serious trouble before that. In fact, there were a couple of years before that where they were engaged in cannibalism in Rome because they had no food. But in 450 AD, they had to admit it was all over. And the rest of the Roman Empire is still there, and they're wondering, what will we do? It's the end. St. Augustine writes the other influential book in Susa, Africa, The City of God. And he says that the reason that Rome fell was because it was a city of men. It was designed by men. If you had a city of God designed and dedicated by God and like God, then you'd be just fine. We have spent all of the time since arguing about what that organization would be. Now Dionysius gave them a clue. It's this hierarchy thing. So that's where we get the pope, the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, and so forth. And that's why you work for somebody who works for somebody who works for somebody who works for somebody. That's not the only way to organize an enterprise. Uh, for example, the Native Americans didn't organize things that way. And other people don't. We do it because of this obscure guy. Because the best pattern had to be the heavenly pattern. Now, when they started organizing nature, Linnaeus, who classified the beginning, the beginning of biology as we know it, classified the, uh, the living things into kingdoms and phyla and orders. He also was thinking of this. It's a hierarchy. And this whole thing before Darwin became known as the chain of being from top to bottom. 
And how was that organized? It's the same thing. It's, it also means that what's on top is better and what's on the bottom is not so good. More of a, more, it's more of classifying people and animals from, from good to bad rather than, yeah. uh, rather than an evolutionary Right, but they didn't have evolution at that point. They sure. had, right. so th they, they organized this chain of being thing. When you go to any uh, museum today, you will see this, this huge tower that starts with the, the beginning of life and it ends in its culmination way up at the top. Man, the highest evolved animal. That's actually coming from Dionysius. As a matter of fact, we've got some competitors for the most highly evolved animal. Uh, in the Ogliocene epoch, there was another species that caused mass extinctions. We aren't the first living thing to cause mass extinctions. Living things have done it a couple of times before. In the Ogliocene, grass took over yeah. and really wiped things out. Um, that has to do with uh, hoofed animals, for example. Most of the hoofed animals we know have two toes. They're two-toed ungulates. Before grass took over, there were lots of single-toed ungulates or odd-toed ungulates. Now there's really only about five groups, horses, elephants, tapers, and a couple of other pieces. The rest of them got wiped out by grass. Hmm. Now cows were evolved to make maximum use of grass. They're ruminants. They have the five stomachs. Sure. So therefore, a cow is just as highly evolved as we are and could just as easily go up on top of that pyramid. They're a late model operation. I don't know. I've always heard that if ever there was a nuclear war that went all over the entire earth, the only thing left would be cockroaches and share. <laughs> she seems to be coming back from everything, doesn't she? Well, they've checked at the bombing ranges and there'd be one other. What's that? Russian thistle. Yeah? Oddly enough. <laughs> Russian thistle. Yep. Huh. But let's get back to Dionysius and, and his times. Okay. So here we've got this pattern that we're supposed to use for a kingdom of God. And Constantine establishes um, Christianity, and he likes this idea. He wants to be the guy at the top. I mean, that works fine for him. Sure. That's also why, Constantine is also why we have a transcendent God. Now, transcendent intimate. Transcendent means he's out somewhere beyond Pluto in the Kuiper belt or wherever. Imminent means he's right in your face. For example, in other religions, uh, the Yorba-based religions like uh, uh, Voodoo, Vodun, and Santeria, their gods are right here. Um, if you ask for their presence, they're going to be right there, and they join the party. They mm -hmm. take somebody over. They're right there. But, uh, but the Christian God, no, he's, he's out there distant. See, that way, Constantine can be the intermediary. He can handle everything while God is gone somewhere. Well, the Roman Empire falls apart, and the Bishop of Rome decides that, that he's going to take that position because that's the last place Peter stopped. Now, Peter, of course, had established bishops and archbishops, and, and, or not bishops and archbishops, but he had consecrated people all along the way. But the last place he stopped was Rome, so the last guy he dealt with was the Bishop of Rome, so he must be Peter's heir. And then the Pope must be the intermediary to replace Constantine. One of the things the Pope had to deal with was the great schism that happened around the time of the Crusades in 1000 and something, when the Greek church said, stuff that, we're leaving. We don't want any part of that nonsense. You're not in charge. So that was one of the, the basis for the great schism that the Pope was back there and having to deal with. You mean when, uh, when the Greek Orthodox Church That's came right. to be? Because they weren't about the, to agree. The popes, you had one in Rome and one in Constantinople? No, no, no. No, no, no. The only time you had two popes was another political thing. That's another problem in that beginning with Constantine, all theology in the Christian church becomes political. Sure. All of the issues that come up are political issues. All of the solutions that come up are political solutions. This is the theology. In other religions, for instance, Islam or Buddhism, mystics have a huge input into what the belief is. And in Native American religions, they keep it right up to date with whatever vision is going on. 
their their stories and so forth change to to conform to what's around them. Ours get frozen solid because we don't want anything to move. But ever after that, the, the courier and all the decisions that are made, every issue that comes up is a political issue. Every decision that's made is a political decision. And that's Christian theology. It's not like anybody else. Uh, Hildegard of Bingham and, and those people, uh, uh, Teresa of Avila. Now, Teresa of Avila was also a political animal. Uh, she did a lot of good political things. But as far as what her visions were, it was like, that's nice, Teresa. But it doesn't go into Christian theology, not unless it turns out to be politically useful. So here we have this organizational structure from uh, Dionysius that you didn't even know that's where it came from. And this way of looking at life that comes from him that you didn't know where that came from. That's why we look at the body and we say, well, the brain's in charge and everybody else is subordinate. Yeah, well, that's one way to look at it. Uh, the biologists at uh, National Institutes of Health are finding out that's probably not going to work very well if we want to continue doing science. Hmm. So we've always, I mean, we've always had the master-slave concept. Uh, well, this is more than master-slave. This is this whole chain thing. Right. This is bosses of bosses of bosses of bosses of bosses. And the word hierarchy actually came from... Dionysius. Yes, it means the order of angels. Well, That's exactly what the word means. Who was Dionysius? You said that his writings were written by someone else later. Or That's right. They, they were written by this monk in Syria. Well, a lot of the Bible's done that way too, written in, in someone else's names. A lot of Paul's writings in the New Testament are, are actually written by a member of his staff or somebody else in his But name. they found but this guy who, out. Who was the real Dionysius? Do, do they know much about him at all? Not at all. He's mentioned by St. Paul. He says, I did this. You know, I converted this mm -hmm. man, and he's mentioned by St. Paul in his writings about uh, Athens, and then So to this it. bishop or whoever it was that did the writing, I guess it was kind of a, a name without a life story, and so he, he people made the writings in. that filled and it, it was, in. Huh? And it was a legitimate thing to do that. That's something else you have to realize. We look at, for example, history today as what happened. History isn't necessarily what happened to people who wrote history in the past. Everybody has to satisfy somebody when they write something like history or science. Mm -hmm. So, for example, history today has to be, uh, science today has, is published in journal uh, publications. And it has to satisfy the people who write those journals. Science in Galileo's day, what was the truth in Galileo's day, was determined by the church. Absolutely. And they determined what was truth. The other thing is that when you wrote if you were smart, you wrote to please the people who were going to do the determination. So if you wrote a history, you wrote a history that would please the person that you wrote. For example, if astrology was the hottest thing going, then you made sure that your history of the Roman Empire, that all of the births of all of the Caesars, was astrologically correct. Yes. Not factually correct, because that's what your patron said was was going to be right. So you said, sure, boss, that's what we'll do. Yeah, I've heard that in, in other instances. Uh, I know a lot of people look to the uh, Josephus as a, a historian to back up a lot of things that the Bible says. And yet uh, I've heard similar things about his writings, that he, uh, once he, he was hiding with the Essenes and then during that war, he, or before that war, he, he sided with the Romans and was a traitor. And he wrote the history for a long time, like you're saying, the way that the Romans would approve of it. Galileo actually got himself in more trouble than he needed to. He was writing his, his uh, writings in a classical Socrates-type dialogue. So he had the guy who knows what he's doing, he had the guy who's the questioner, and he has the guy who's the idiot. Mm -hmm. Well, the guy who's the idiot um, said a lot of things that were the same thing as the Pope had said. <laughs> I mean, in quotation marks, especially towards the end. This was not one of the... Galileo, although he may have been very smart, was not into influencing friends, you know, making friends and, and influencing influence people. people. Yeah. That may have gotten him in as much trouble as what he actually said, because he was such a darn fool about doing a thing like that. Mm -hmm. He got really cocky and stuck that in, and, and that got personal.
Yes. The church took care of that, didn't they? But what I'm saying is that styles of writing vary. And at the time that this monk wrote, it was perfectly acceptable to do what he did and not tell anybody what you'd done because the people who read it would know who wrote it because he handed it to them. Mm -hmm. Of course, then the authorship got lost. The way they nailed him down is he was discussing uh, issues of doctrine, arguments, these political arguments, that came up long after Paul had left the scene. And they nailed it down to the 6th century, and then they nailed it down to these things were taking place in Syria. So that's how they know who he really was. It's like Paul wasn't, wouldn't have been talking about these things because they didn't come up until later, uh -huh. all these issues. And that's what brought their system. Some, some church scholar actually traced it down and said, nope, this isn't, the, this isn't the right thing. This isn't for real. And so they took him off and put him on the shelf. But the problem is, he's still part of our history and our thinking to a very deep extent. So a, lo a lot of, if I understand correctly, you're saying that his hierarchical system um, from angels to humans and demons, uh, humans were included in that hierarchy. Yes, of course. Um, translated into our social way of doing business. Right. Our, our everyday it's life. It's the way God did it. That's the way the church was going to do it. That's the way the king was going to do it. That's the way General Motors is going to do it. Yeah. Really? Now, there's been some experimentation and management with something called matrix management. They're starting to fiddle around with this. That didn't work, but maybe they'll find something else that works. But yeah, that's, that's where this comes from. Well, what about, to play devil's advocate here a little bit, uh, what about uh, areas of the world, China or, or some place where this type of, of teaching would not have been influential? If you look at it and you don't use Western eyeballs, you find some different patterns and different arrangements. Um, Japan, with its daimyos, was completely busted up. The, uh, the hierarchies there are really shallow. You've got the daimyo, you've got the, uh, the samurai, and you've got the riffraff. It's three layers, that's all. Hmm. There's none of this huge, big stack thing. Worker, foreman, first line supervisor, second you got line it. supervisor. You got it. Mid-level <laughs> management, upper level, and CEO. And you have it. Huh. You don't see that. And we owe all that to Dionysius. Yeah, well, some, to the to the person who pretended to be to the guy who pretended to be this. This also gets into uh, racism. Remember this biological pattern: you had good on top and not so good on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, shortly after Darwin, uh, when they really didn't know what they were doing, you had Western man at the top of the human scale, and you had the Adam and Islanders who were considered somewhat similar to orangutans, and not much mm -hmm. different. So this whole superiority of racism is kind of traced back to this. Hmm, that's very Things are not on an equal level. You have the same problem in moving to the concept of ecology. We have this concept of, you know, guys come first, man comes first. Well, if he acts like that, he's not going to get to stick around very much longer. Uh, James Lovelock came up with something called the Gia hypothesis, uh, in which he said you could look at the entire globe biologically as a single living entity, like our body. And it was a halfway decent model. So some New Age and Green people have started, and he called this thing Gia, after an old Greek god. So some New Age and, and pagan and Wiccan people have started worshiping Gia. And Lovelock came back and he said, you know, he said, I said you could, you could act as if it existed. I never said she gave a damn about people. <laughs> she, the I thing is just here to function. We're part of it. If, yeah, we, get, if we get cancerous, we're out of here. Yeah, that is, a, that is a good thought. You could look at the world like a human, uh, a person, an animal. Because oh, it you, gets even, even a human, you know, our skin has these little, tiny, little microscopic things that just live all over us and in us and around us. And I we, have you know, we don't really think about it, and it's like that if we were a world with, with people and animals on it. Number one, I have read that if you do a cell count, there are more cells where you're sitting. I, I, I assume you practice decent hygiene, even. Uh -huh. There are more cells of things where you're sitting that don't belong to you than belong to you. Really? One of the revolutions that's going to hit, again, against this, uh, in this century, that's going to be really shocking, uh, Lovelock has a, a friend of his by the name of Lynn Margulis, 
The book is What is Life? It is written for, for the rest of us, but it's hard reading. But if Lynn Margulis is correct, you and I, as we stand, have a lot more in common with a coral reef than you might think. Yeah, I've heard that. Uh... She's trying to, sh we already know that on a cell level, for instance, there's this recent uh, argument about some fertility work that's being done here, I think here in the United States, where they take part of the cell from another woman and put it into the cell of an infertile woman and then fertilize it. And the part they take is something called a mitochondria. Now the mitochondria has its own DNA. It's a little, what they call an organelle. It sits inside all of our cells, mm -hmm. all the cells of all animals. This thing handles the energy business. It's the energy broker. And it's got its own agenda. In each of your cells, you have this, this incorporated little organism with its own DNA that's got its own or agenda. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're worried about mixed genetics. I don't think so, because that's not us. That's somebody else hmm. who just happens to live inside us. But this looks like it happens at several levels, that the cell is an accumulation, is, is a, an, uh, a community of things, that the body is actually a community of things, that the whole world is a community of things, and none of them are a hierarchy. In Dionysius's hierarchy, how was it, um, what, what all did it, in, it had God and angels and people, and oh, it's very what detailed. about his concept of the bottom, was it? Was it uh, it's, it's very detailed. The bottom part of the hierarchy, was it any? The, the, lesser, the lesser devils, of course, are higher the, on, the, on the chain than the big guys because they've, they're, they're less capable, they've sinned less, they're less evil, so little imps come in, at the, the, I think, at the first layer. But was it anything like are the modern-day concept of hell or Dante's Inferno? That uh, I don't that know. Kind of We're just talking about organization here. Okay. Um, but, of course, Dante's Inferno has that, too. But this is this, is this, this is why it's the, the mirror of the upper one. Mm -hmm. The most powerful one there is at the bottom, because he's the worst. And the most powerful one here is God at the top because he's the best. So even though he's at the bottom, he's still very powerful. Oh, we didn't say anything about this. This is like goodness. Okay. So he's the least good thing in the world. Okay. So there's this, this hierarchy, God which again emphasizes goodness mm -hmm. over everything else. By the way, not many people realize that Satan or the, is, is a Christian deity. Atheists don't believe in him. Buddhists don't believe in him. Shintoists don't believe in him. Taoists don't believe in him. Mm -hmm. So Satan is a Christian deity. Yes. And those who worship Satan um, are a Christian sect. They can be nothing else. And there's, you know, it's interesting you mention that because there's really not that much in the Bible about hell, um, especially if, unless you take some of Revelation. But most, you know, there's just not that much about it, really. I think most of the Christians' modern-day concept of hell comes from other, like Dante's Inferno and other, other writings. Well, what you said just brought me to something else. I was talking about political theology. Until about 800 AD, um, Christianity incorporated reincarnation. But the Pope at about 800 and something. What, what time frame is this? About 800 and something. Uh, the Pope in around 800 and something decided this was giving people too much of an easy way out. If you had reincarnation, you had multiple shots. Mm -hmm. So Christian theology changed to, nope, you get one shot, then you wait, and then judgment. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that was added for political reasons by about 800. The Jewish religion also had this in it and was probably influenced by Christianity to sort of fade it out. Is that about the same time that limbo, the Catholics brought up this, that limbo, nether, not netherworld, uh, I purgatory think, is what I'm thinking of, purgatory. I think that. And I know they've always regretted that middle, having brought that up. Well, there's that middle ground. That was brought in when the, when the church found they really liked what the Greek philosophers had to say because the Greek philosophy reinforced the church's political theology. In other words, what the Greeks said about the way the world really was reinforced what the church was saying about and gave them ideas to say more things about the way the world was, which put things the way the church wanted it for power reasons. But then they had to reconcile these philosophers. I mean, if these guys were going to be good enough to be used by the church, but they weren't Christians. So um, 
they had to put them in somewhere else. So they said, these were good guys that were sitting in this middle land. This is where Dante meets them, this Elysian Fields sort of middle limbo thing. Mm -hmm. They had never had the opportunity to be Jews or to be uh, with Christ, so they, they, had this, they put them in there. That's, that's mm -hmm. how they got in there. How did you come across this book? How did you find out about uh, the Dionysius thing, the pseudo Dionysius? Well, I moved here from Maryland, and I went to an awful lot of lectures at the Smithsonian. And uh, I learned an awful lot there. This book uh, cropped up both in stories, uh, in, in the material on, on the political history, and on the history of mysticism, which I was interested in. So it cropped up twice, which is why I got a copy, even though I was having a heck of a time waiting my way through it. Mm -hmm. Recently, the, uh, by the way, the Smithsonian uh, had a problem and had to re uh, drop funding and got in trouble for it. And I saw an article where they referred to as a government-supported institution. They're not government-supported by much. A long time ago they were, but 10 years ago they were only 20% on government funding and uh, probably much less now. So your government's not paying for them and they've got problems. Of course, that's part of the, the uh, uh, where your budget surplus is coming from, is money not spent. I'm sure we'll bail them out if they ever get into serious trouble. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah. Anyways, the, towards the end of my time there, they, were, they stopped bringing in speakers and started just bringing in people doing book flogging. Same thing you can get in Borders Books, mm -hmm. which made my decision to leave Maryland a lot easier. <laughs> darn shame, too. Well, is this, a, how, is this an easy book for people to read? Is it Not a, at all. No, it's pretty... It's, it's nasty. Pretty heavy kind of book. If you're interested in mysticism, this, is, this book is critical, but, uh, which I am. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, I'm just stubborn. <laughs> I want to know why I, why I think the way I think. Sure. I think we all do. I think we're all on kind of a, a journey of knowledge. Uh, I know in the community that I'm now a part of with the uh, agnostic humanist, atheist, non-theist, uh, people who have uh, tossed aside religion, or in my case it was sort of a slow studying your way out of it, um, I think there's a lot of that, finding out more about ourselves and what we know, and I've discovered there's so much more knowledge out there that, that I never knew existed because I just had my face in the one book for so long. Well, if you, if you want to be a, a free thinker, you have to know what part of your thought is free and what part you got from somewhere else. Now, the name of the book, one more time, is? Pseudo Dionysius, um, Paulist Press. Pseudo Dionysius, okay. Pseudo Dionysius. Only for the stubborn, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not real big, but it's, it's just heavy stuff. It's nasty. Okay. Well, Hugh, thank you very much for being with us on Free Thought Forum, uh, for taking the time to tell us all about this. I'm, you've got my interest up now. I'm going to have to get online and find out a little bit more about Dionysius and Pseudo Dionysius. Well, I'll, I'll, I'm threatening to come back and tell you more things you don't need to know. Okay, great. Love to see it, love to hear it. And we'd like to thank you for being with us. Once again, we've been talking with Hugh Henry. Thanks again, Hugh, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on Free Thought Forum. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to Duke or Dictator. No person can deny, Deacon Duncan Sin Fry. No 